Well, I know people are like still passion M and M's, so we'll get started in about a minute. Oh, did? Oh, good. <laughs> He's such a mother hen. <laughs> These guys survive, right? <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. Yeah. You know, because I have these little uh, shakers. Yeah. At one point, I was kind of like... Oh, it's like the opera. We should walk around with a little, little, little xylophone. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Raw hi. No, that's Bonanza. Bonanza. Yep. That's banana. <coughs> Kid, I never understood why there was a show called Banana. <laughs> and it had <laughs> cowboys in it. Oh, there go the caterers. Should we get started? Yeah, it's 4.02, like that, 4.04, 4.03, take the average, what? Oh, <laughs> are you done being a mother hen and chasing all your chicks into uh <laughs> Yeah, there's nobody up there, everybody's gone home. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's get started. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi, John. <laughs> My name is... John Mayer, <laughs> and I'm the executive director of Cali. Um, so, so what? Why are you here? What, what, what do you want to? What do you want to know about? What? State of Cali. All right. Why is your future so bright? Why is our future so bright? Good. That's a, so. Right. So I did title the. the I did title it. Uh, Cali's future is so bright. You'll need sunglasses. Which I should have looked up where that was from. I didn't know it was from a Timbuk Three song. <laughs> um, wasn't it? Yeah, Timbuk Three. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think it, there's a there's a reference to it before that. Um, I thought it was an Andy Warhol thing actually. Oh, yeah. I'd recently been to the Andy Warhol Museum. So um, so, but uh, obviously it was intentional to type, to name it to to name the presentation that. And it's 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 uncharacteristic. I'm 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 always if I'm optimistic, I'm cautiously optimistic. And um, I have I mean I have a lot of uh, I, I like to play with aphorisms as ways to uh, as ways to guide my heuristic thinking. So I, I prefer to underpromise and overdeliver. And so if you're if you're overly optimistic, you say we're going to do great this year, and then you, you don't do you you do okay, you know then. Then you fail because you didn't reach your goal. And if you did great, well, then all you did was meet expectations. You know, it's it's hard to exceed great. Um, so all all I'm trying to explain is that me being optimistic in this way is uncharacteristic. But I believe there's reason to be optimistic right now with Cali, um, and because. Um, uh, you know, because because uh, the drum thing went so well, <laughs> um, I, I I kind of wanted to I, I wanted to do I wanted to do this on a positive note, 
rather than on my cautiously uh, optimistic or slightly pessimistic sort of thing. So anyhow, let me, let me just dig into it. Here's my TLDR. Um, you know, if you fall asleep in, in the next uh, 12 minutes or so, at least you got what I was going to talk about. I'm going to talk about Lesson Live and QuizWrite. Um, we always have to come up with Googleable words for the titles of our projects. Um, and if you're wondering what quiz write means, it's like playwright, but for quizzes. Clever, huh? Oh, well, okay. We're working on that. A to J author is basically just a decision tree author, you know, and I'll talk about that. And there are decision trees all over the place in law. I, as a matter of fact, if, because I'm not a lawyer, I can say this and only sound a little stupid. Um, all of law is just decision trees with a little bit of uh, client hand-holding uh, filled in there. Um, Elaine Delve is our electronic, our uh, open, open uh, casebook project. It is slowly, slowly changing the default of course materials, and I'll talk about that. Incubators, uh, I'll talk about how I think they're the, they're the, they're, there is great promise in the future of incubators and Cali uh, helping uh, the incubator movement out because that practice tech has a relationship to the ed tech that Cali does. And uh, we're going to uh, get a lot noisier with our staff. We're going to be hiring some more people. So we're, gonna, we're, we're in growth phase right now. So first lesson live. So here's, a, here's what a typical Cali lesson looks like. You probably have never seen it because you just assigned them to your students and don't know what they look like yourself. But, but what happens with a Cali lesson, so I, don't, I, I hope you all knew this, is that when you assign a lesson to a student or when a student comes to our website and logs in and runs a lesson, they can see their own scores, right? They can go in and find out how well they did. They get a little certificate at the end, but nobody else can see their scores, right? Except when a faculty member goes to the website and picks a lesson and creates what we call a lesson link. So that's a special URL that's different from the regular URL. And when they hand that to the student and the student runs the lesson, it, that same score information becomes visible to the, stu to, the, to the faculty member, right? Why would we do that? Formative assessment, right? So here's, what, uh, here's, here's the website. Uh, so, so here's what the, the, the faculty member can go in and see their links, their lesson links that they created. Um, for up to this point, we're, we, we've kept it fairly uh, pragmatic, very rudimentary, you know, lists of things that they can do. It's not an LMS by any standard. It's, it's a collection of resources, you might say. They would pluck these things out, the URLs that go to these lessons, and stick them in to <coughs> Twen or to Blackboard or some other LMS where the students would follow those links. But from here, and, and I, I, this is just a made-up one. You can see that the business financing and federal security laws have been run 13 times. And there's buttons that they can press that pull up more information about, about, the, uh, about the student runs and the lessons. All right, this is all, that's all old, old stuff. We've had that for, how, long, how old is Lesson Link? Maybe uh, 10 years? Not that old, not that old. Yeah, about Six or 12 years, yes. Okay, so, so Lesson Link's been around forever. So what's new is this thing where, that we, that we call Lesson Live. And the use case here is that the faculty member can run a lesson, can, can do the same thing, create a Lesson Link, run a lesson inside the classroom, and then the students, if they run the same lesson through that Lesson Link, the faculty member can follow, can see their scores, and broadcast them back to them. So here's, here's what it sort of looks like. It's the lesson being run on the left and the list of participants of the students down there. You know, nothing particularly fancy here. It's a little bit like having clickers, except running them. It's like, it's like we welded clickers into Cali lessons for inside the classroom. Now, there's a feature on that that says, you know, does the, this, was, this is what the instructor would see, the faculty member. Would you like to reveal the student names? If yes, you know, the names will be revealed. So a little, you know, a little, in case somebody thinks there's a FERPA problem or I don't want to show the students that, you know, which students are smarter or dumber than the others or something like that. There's that uh, step there. But if they do reveal the information, then they immediately can see on a per question basis, which students got it right or wrong, red and green, um, how many students selected A, how many students selected B, how many students selected C. What is all this about? This is all about formative assessment. 
we're not expecting people to run final exams on this. We're expecting that this is an interactive way in the classroom. That's one use case for faculty to find out if the students are tracking and for students to say, oh man, I got that wrong. Right? And so that becomes an opportunity for the faculty member to say, you know, that was an easy question. We're, we haven't gotten to the hard questions yet. And to delve into why students might get a question right or wrong. Or, you know, and especially there's like signals here, right? If, if most of the class got a question wrong, that might be an excuse or a message back to the faculty member to say, maybe I better talk about that a little bit more. You know, that's, inf that's formative assessment, but in that case, the, the, uh, the information is coming to the faculty on how they're teaching, all right? So you may not have known about a product or a project that we had before called Instapol. It was a, intended to be a, a web-based replacement for clickers. It's like I said, it's, it's Instapol married to, uh, hey, Brian, it's Instapol married to uh, Cali Author. So that was just one use case. Right? That was an in the classroom use case, a live version. That's what lesson live. The next use case for this is well, something that we, you know, it makes sense to just uh, say, well, it's lesson passed. So, in other words, a faculty member could create a lesson link, stick it on the LMS, send it to the students via email, tell them, everybody run this lesson in the next couple of days. And then when, they're, when, when they went, when after the, all the students have run it, they could go into the lesson themselves and see. <coughs> how the students did. Now, it's not a live situation. It's, it's using the lesson itself as a reporting tool for how well the students did for that formative assessment. They can also click a button and pop up uh, reports that basically show the students here. I think I've got a, uh, an actual live one here. And that's a little bit easier to see. Yeah, here's a real one. Well, not real, but an actual working version of this. So it, it, it generate, you can generate a report. This is a report. This is the parole evidence rule. Here's the list of students who at some point in the past, up to the point this report was generated, took this lesson, how many they got right or wrong. Um, I, I, can, I can sort, you know, to see who's the smartest or dumbest or who's, who's the highest scoring or lowest scoring student. I have to be careful of my terminology. And, um, and I can expand this. You know, if I want to see um, uh, more information about all the data and, and if the student ran the lesson multiple times, right? Smart student will go into that link, run it through, write down all the correct answers, you know, if they got it right, then run it a second time and get it, you know, get 100%. We understand that. This is not intended to be a final exam, but there's the, uh, there's the student having run, the, uh, run this lesson three times. Actually, in this case, run them two minutes apart, but that was because this was uh, sample data being generated for the purposes of uh, demonstration. All right. So there's no way to know what the score was on each run. Uh, got score on each run. Elmer can answer. Yes. Yes. Is that not in the download? Not, not directly from this report. Yeah. So, so you can actually get that through. I think you can get that here. Yeah. Right. So here I can expand this to include the response breakdown and list the students for each response. So this shows every single question, every student that answered it, and whether or not they got it right or wrong. You know, so it's a drill down, though, right? And yeah, in a, in a, there's, a, there's also an additional, because we kept the old reports. Mm -hmm. So, so the old reports also show up on the lesson link page, and those had a listing of every single run that the student did. Um, Here's the old reports. They're listed under summary. So if you look at that table, that yeah. will show yep. you each individual run. So in doing this, we're, we're, we're running into the problem that there, you know, we can hand you um, um, buckets of information, but you know, what you, what, what What's really useful here, so, so we have to get into the heads of faculty and say, well, what are you trying to accomplish? I mean, we, we think we know what we want faculty to do. We want them to use this information to change the way they teach or to improve their teaching. We want the students to use it to say, maybe my approach to learning this isn't working. I need to change it or something like that. But it's, it's just not quite that simple is all I'm saying. Thank <laughs> you.
So, you know, so we're, we're sort of creaking open the Pandora's box of learning analytics here, but in, in, in every way, handing it, to the, handing it to faculty and saying, you get to control how much you want to see or how you want to do this so that we can uh, um, start to explore, you know, how to build uh, tools that are particularly relevant. <clears throat> so, so I just described Lesson Link, or Kelly Lessons and Lesson Link, which is old, and then we layered on top of that Lesson Live and Lesson Past, lots of terminology here, which gives you more reports. So there's another layer that we're building, or another column here, that we call QuizWrite. And the reason for that is you could take Kelly Author right now. It's a piece of software we've written 14 years ago, Samia. <laughs> it's that old. It's written in Visual Basic. Um, you could write a lesson. You could write a quiz in it. And then there's an option to do an upload to the, to the Kelly website, which creates something very similar to a lesson link and then does all of these sort of things. But it's a Windows-only program. It, it has... 14 different page types, and some of the page types have three or four different options. So it's kind of a bear to learn. And if you're a faculty member, you're like, I just want to toss out some multiple choice questions. I don't want to, I don't want to go into an hour or 10 hour cycle of learning a new piece of software, right? So that's what QuizWrite is. It's a web-based <coughs> authoring tool. So no Windows dependence. It's browser-based um, for the A to J people in here. Should sound familiar. And um, and right now, you know, and it's basically in alpha, maybe in beta at this point. But the idea behind it is that a faculty member could go to the website, bang out a couple of multiple choice questions, press a button, and all that infrastructure I just talked about, where there's now a URL that you can hand to your students, you could run it in the classroom, see the student scores, or you could look at them asynchronously or, or in, in, the, in the past. You know, is all, that's what this is all built on top of. And it's open source. Although, Elmer, will, you can comment on this, it being open source at this point isn't that useful because it kind of depends on a whole bunch of infrastructure that, that, that we can't just put in a package and hand to people. Elmer. Right, and we'll talk about that a little bit more tomorrow because part of our, our long-term goal once we get this running is, is to open source... Yeah, the infrastructure. So the, the infrastructure for running the lessons also, so that, um, uh, so that, so that you would be able to run this, um, you know, sort of locally on your local network. Well, then why would we want to run locally? I mean, hey, we're Cali. You just come to us. And the answer is um, agency. You know, we're we're your we're we're not here to to lock you into our silos. We're here to give you the power to do to explore this any way you want. And so if you want to run these things in your own local environment, which is to say, create your own collections of quiz questions, but you view that as a competitive advantage against other law schools, have at it. You know, we, we shouldn't be the ones to judge you uh, for uh, being such greedy bastards. I mean, for, uh, for having that um, strategic decision made. <coughs> just kidding. So, and, and this is just mocked up, sorry, Elmer. So Quiz Live, you know, looks, look, looks exactly the same as, like, Lesson Live would sort of look. The students would click on the button. By the way, it's pretty cool. Um, when the faculty member starts to run the lesson or the quiz, you know, and the student goes to the quiz, if the faculty member is, like, three or four questions down, they can click on the button, and it will just take them right to where the faculty member is. It's like a, it's like a, sync, a synchronization sort of thing that's pretty neat. So that's what QuizWrite looks like, but I've actually got it up and running. I've got it, yeah. And, and, uh, and, and you should yawn when you see this. In other words, there's nothing exciting here in terms of interface because we're going for minimalism here. You know, it's a multiple choice question. That means there's a question, there's four responses, and there's like, you know, which one is right. Um, you know, we've got all sorts of ideas for, uh, you know, well, can you add pictures? Can you stick video in there? But all of that is fluff as far as we're concerned. We want to stick to the simplest, most straightforward <laughs> stuff, which is multiple choice questions because they can deliver. You now, writing a multiple choice question is in itself hard, but, 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 we're, but we're, going, we're going slow here rather than fast on features. There are literally thousands of programs you can buy, download, install, play with that involve multiple choice questions. It was just in the session before this one in which they were using something called Kahoot. 
which is pretty cool. I like Kahoot. It's like a Jeopardy sort of a thing. Um, you know, almost all of them, though, are, are, are there's open source ones, but most of them aren't open source. Um, a lot of them lock up your lock up your your data. Um, there, there's problems, um, and w rather than trying to adopt something that 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 doesn't quite work in our in our environment, we decided we had to build it our own, and we're building it you know slowly to understand the problem space and serve it as best we can. Whoops. Can I shift to five? I can. <coughs> All right. So a key feature of this which isn't completely built out, but, but, but we fully plan to do that, is that we, we want people to tag questions. We want every question, and not just tagged with whether it's property law or torts or animal law, but we, if, you, if you know deeply about Cali, you know that we have these things called topic grids. So, there, it's a, so torts has like a hundred items in it. It's, so, it's, a, it's the equivalent of like an, uh, a, um, the mother of all outlines for a course or for property or torts or for everything like that. And what we would like the community to do is that whenever they write a multiple choice question, they don't just say this is a torts question, they say this is, uh, sorry, let me pick something that I know a little tiny bit about. Instead of saying it's a property question, they'll say it's an adverse possession question or it's a rule against perpetuities question or something. In other words, if you want it to be tagged to as great a degree of granularity as we can get them to do it. And the reason for that is down the road when there are hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of questions, we already know that there are use cases where students are at the final, you know, working on their final exams and they're like, you know, I want to be, I want to be tested on a couple of hundred rule against perpetuities questions, <laughs> you know, and, and then if they can search for that and find it, they are immensely happy. And the same thing might be true for faculty saying, man, these people are struggling with this. You know, maybe I can go out to the crowdsourced, sorry, not the crowdsourced, the, uh, the, 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 the community-based shared database of multiple choice questions of which there are a hundred property law teachers out there and each one of them have written ten rule against perpetuities questions, <coughs> pull them in and hand them to my students so they can really grind and drill on that very difficult concept. Right? But all that depends that they tag these things you know, right up front. And so we're very cognizant of making it easy to tag that you know, up front. So that's what this is about, quiz right. Super fast, super fast formative assessment. Built on top of this whole Cali author sort of infrastructure, this lesson link thing, this auto-published thing, and, you know, and, and further built on top of this brand new lesson live, lesson past sort of thing. I apologize that we have all these weird words, but I, I found that when we come up with unique names within our teams to talk about projects, the conversations about the projects go faster. The problem comes when we have to like expose them to the to you, where, where you don't have the familiarity with them, you know. But for us, it's like it, it makes the project uh, design work and discussions go a lot faster, you know. And then, I don't know, quiz writing ain't a bad name, right? Kind of, it's, it's a little clever. It's a little clever. <laughs> no software to install. The whole point here is faculty agency. I put that students in there because, you know, as soon as you make something that faculty can use to bang out questions, well, why don't you give it to students too? Let them write questions for each other. Let them create study groups. You know, down you can download the data in CSV or Excel format, and of course it'll be open source. So. There's at least three, just this simple thing, there's at least three solid use cases. Uh, the, the classroom live case I just told you about, the synchronous distance learning case. So your, the faculty members on a WebEx or a GoToMeeting or a Joinus, whatever it is, and they're displaying their screen, the students are listening, you know, and then they say, here's a link, you know, in the chat or in the, the, the message box. The students can go off and run a quiz. The faculty member can see their answers and display them back anonymously or not, you know, so it's a, it's a way to turn a distance learning synchronous situation into something a little bit interactive. And if, and you've, if any of you have had to like sit for an hour or two hours or three hours, you know, watching somebody lecture their, through their PowerPoints, 
you know, the urge to alt tab <laughs> and check your mail or do something else is huge. So you, you, we've got to solve the problem of interaction and engagement online or, you know, people just tune it out, right? Because they are, they are optimizers. I'm bored. I'm gone. <laughs> so I'll get back to that question in a second. Uh, and I noticed I spelled asynchronous wrong. Crap. Um, so I've, and the, the asynchronous use case should be obvious, right? You, you create the quiz. You toss it out there. You tell the students do this in three days. You come back after three days and you see how they did using those reporting tools. That's the, that's the no-brainer one, right? So, so, so here's, here's where I'll, I'll start to address your question. So as soon as you think of this, you like, you're like, wow, man, we should, like, we should get like, faculty in every area to like, start writing questions right now. And, the, and Cali's a consortium of law students, law schools. That, they're, they're perfect for that. You know? and, then, you know, and the open source thing lets people create local banks if they want to use that to a competitive advantage. It's like, oh, 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 what if we had an essay question example where the students wrote the essays and then the faculty member could see them and grade them, sort of like an, a dashboard for helping them uh, grade their things. Oh, even better, how about if the students could read each other's essays as a sort of a first pass through, sort of like Harvard Berkman's uh, rotisserie project from about eight or nine years ago, or the uh, Perceptive uh, software that costs 25 bucks and has an awful dashboard. You know, all these are like really good ideas that we're thinking, well, now we can start to address some of these things. But, oh, wait, 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 we have these free case books. What if we built some sort of widget where at the end of the chapter, the chapter is tagged with those taxonomy terms I was talking about and automatically scrape whatever questions it could suck in right there. That could be like this growing, wonderful things. Let students write questions for each other as study groups. We can crowdsource this. Oh, man, we could crowdsource this. We could like have competitions between schools crowdsourcing this. We could gamify this. We could have leaderboards. It's like, whoa, calm down, bro. <laughs> Right, right, right. But I, but I swear, I like, I was going through this. I'm like slamming out all these ideas, and then I'm like, oh man, I got really got to slow down, <laughs> you know, because that's going to overwhelm people's ability to uh, to do that. But one step at a time. With with this sort of platform or with this sort of uh, beginnings, you know, we can begin to just passionately. Uh, 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 examine those ideas and see if we want things like timers or uh, set limits or stuff like that. Yeah? So we'll see. We'll see. All right. John, John? Sally. I have a question. Sure. Um, I don't think you talked about the answers. Uh, that'll be kind of useful for the question. Is it expected that, that people are going to write, you know, have the correct answer and an explanation why that is correct and why some of the others are wrong so the students can learn from an explanation rather than, you know, B is right and C is wrong? So, so, so if I'm paying someone to write questions, yes, I want the answers and model answers. Um, but users of it could leave the answers blank. <coughs> They are required, though, to uh, probably are going to be required to at least designate which one is a right, a right answer. Yes, you know, um, but but getting people to write good uh, feedback is, uh, is 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 a challenge. You know, if they don't want to, if they if they want to use it as a way to uh, use the 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 live version as just here's the questions, I'll do the feedback inside the classroom in front of the students. Well, but if students are trying to work with each other or something like that, I can see that could get kind of not right. I mean, if Right, so there's going to be good questions and bad questions. Right. Those that have good feedback and those that don't, and we have to... That's or they're going to have <coughs> questions that are answered incorrectly. And oh, oh even worse, even worse. <laughs> Elmer. Right, so, so here's the... So, and then this is... And we'll go into more detail tomorrow. So there's, there, there is space for feedback with the questions now. So you can provide, uh, uh, you can provide a, a single piece of feedback that, that comes up that lets the students know, besides if it was right or wrong, like sort of what the explanation is. That's, but that's optional. Because as I was saying, if you're, in, if you're in a classroom situation, or maybe you just want to do two quick, two quick questions, yep. true or false, you can just do it through it. <coughs> the other thing is, is that the whole sharing part the, the, uh, is, uh, is disabled right now. So 
So, um, so, so we're, we're, we're looking at getting folks used to the idea of doing these and creating personal question banks. And then we're going to turn on the sharing features as we develop those um, to, to allow people. And then it'll become more important for certain questions. Um, and, and we don't actually have a really solid uh, roadmap for opening this up to students right now. There's, there's a whole set of issues around how you know letting students in to create or find questions on their own and that sort of stuff that um, that we haven't that we're aware of, but we haven't you don't really have a roadmap for that. We're not even sure about the sharing part. I mean, we know we want to do it, but we don't know. So, so not, none of this is rocket science. I mean, these, these have been done, projects like these have been done since, uh, in, in, I, I mean, the first one I worked on was in the 80s, <laughs> you know, and then in the 90s. And so, so we, there has to be some consideration to, to how, you, how you get community uh, engagement and attachment to this. Michael. So I guess I, as I think about it, when I, when I use response systems and my questions are always geared to the context of my lecture. Mm -hmm. So that's very specific to how I've developed it. So I just I'm curious how you would create a, a bank. <coughs> My lecture I think is specialized, you know, stuff I've developed, and so the response that I'm looking for is based on the response to what I'm presenting, as opposed to what someone else has created. Their lecture. Right. So you got to have uh, um, um, lines between the, the questions you've written and are yours, and can easily be found. Questions that you found that you wanted to pull across into yours, or that you want to use, you know, and questions that you don't, and that has to be pretty easily and quickly um, uh, discernible. Well, to bounce back to Sally's question, I mean, that's why I think having why their answer is right uh -huh. is hugely important because I may not necessarily agree based on uh, the fluidity <laughs> of the law. <laughs> no, we have that problem with Cali lessons now. People will oh, say. Yeah. You know, these are wonderful lessons, and I'm sure that fellow at Harvard was a smart guy, but I don't agree <laughs> with, with what he wrote here. <laughs> but I do think you just have to think about that, because if you're putting them out there with answers, I think people are going to expect that they're fairly correct. You've got you to handle expectations at, at every step of the way, right. You know, this was not written by a faculty member. This was written by a student or something like that. I agree. So what's the big picture here on this piece? And the big picture is one of my favorite paintings ever. This is uh, Don Quixote by Picasso. And that is that um, simple is both beautiful and hard. <laughs> and, and this is a simple idea of multiple choice questions. And it can be very powerful in formative assessment. And I'm so happy that law, legal education is discovering this. <laughs> it sounds weird to even say that. You know, but it also can be very difficult. I'm sure. He, well, I don't know, knowing Picasso, he might have just slapped this out in a half hour, but it's, it's, I, I've stared at this for, for uh, long periods of time and, and found interesting things to see in this, in this painting. The second thing is silos, silos everywhere, which is um, a lot of the tools the, uh, that, that are available for, for free or for download or for websites or for purchase lock people into the, into the particular interface. Um, and I would like that to be a little looser. Not because I want people in my silo, they shouldn't be in somebody else's silo, but because I think we don't know the perfect way to do this. And so we need fluidity in the material so that when people say, wait a minute, I've got a thousand questions and I've got this great idea, but that's going to require touching every, thing, every, what, every thousand questions, you know? And so you want to you want to keep things in a in a in a in a format that allows for some kind of uh, uh, experimentation and innovation. Formative assessment, I believe, is a muscle, and we're going to have to exercise it. Faculty are going to have to exercise it to get better and stronger at it. And I'm, and I especially mean that in legal education because we're so bad at it. You know, where the 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 stereotype is. There aren't any multiple choice questions or midterms. There's only the final exam, and that's the only feedback that people get in their, in their <coughs> courses. I know that's not true, and especially not true of the faculty who are in this room right now, because if you're here, you're the smart ones. But, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Faculty are on that learning curve, and the tools need to be open and flexible. A to J author. So A to J Author is a, is a project that we've been working on for 14 years, almost. Um, and in that time, it's been uh, used almost 
at this point, it's almost probably close to four million times. It's produced over <coughs> two million documents. It is an authoring system that lets legal aid faculty automate <coughs> court forms or legal processes so that poor people can help themselves or generate their own, their own legal uh, documents. All right, think TurboTax, think LegalZoom, or call it LegalAidZoom. Oh, it's late. I'm not getting that. That that I got guffaws at the last time I said that word. <coughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We, we just took the cheers. <laughs> so uh, so the big deal with A to J, uh, the the old version of A to J uh, was written in Flash. Um, uh, Flash was wonderful in uh, 2004 when there were browser wars, Netscape and IE, but it's, uh, it's a dead end right now because it doesn't run on iPads and iPhones. Um, and so the new version written by some obscure uh, organization that we hired, oh, hi, Brian, good to see you. <laughs> Actually, by our, by our very good partners and friends, uh, Betovi, who, uh, who've, who've saved our bacon by uh, making, this, making this project uh, cross the finish line. Um, you know, it has a. Uh, it, it now has a responsive, so you can run it on a run, run it on a phone. It has some basic document assembly capability in it. I got to pause and say, this is a huge deal, right? Almost there. There are lots of document assembly tools out there. Hot Docs, Form Tool, uh, maybe a dozen other. If you've ever gone to ABA Tech Show, you've seen you know the booth, booth after booth after booth. Every single one, or almost every single one of them, is written in .NET or as a or on top of Word or Windows. Almost all of them presume that you have this bank of documents and you're going to start by opening a document and marking it up. All right? Our model for the design of this is that it's not Word and it's not Windows because those are silos. Those, those prevent you from doing things like using a Macintosh, for instance. All right? You can't run .NET tools on a Mac, even in the Word version of Mac. So we wrote this in JavaScript. <coughs> Essentially, so that you can, so that you you do the document assembly, you do the authoring, the template development inside inside the browser. You don't start from a document that you mark up. You basically start from a blank screen, and then you construct a document like a collection of Lego blocks. Right? It's it's a little it's a, it's it's hurts to it hurts for people that are used to the old document assembly capability to use our tool because it doesn't look like it. And we might be doing it all wrong, you know. But I think that it's, it's I'm, I'm pulling a Gretzky here. I'm, I'm skating to where the puck's going to be in a couple of years when people understand that this is just Lego blocks, right? Uh, almost all that, all those assemblies, no, all those assemblies that I had in that last screen, those two million, were hot docs assemblies. A to J author collected the information, squirted a little bit of XML over to hot docs, pretended it was a hot docs answer file, and then hot docs said, my children, and then turned it into a document. Now it's optional, at least that's the goal. So what's going on here? A to J author is not a justice author, it's not a legal author, it's, it's a decision tree author. Right? And like I was saying before, decision trees are everywhere in, in law and legal education. Decision trees have, are essentially expert systems, but I'm a computer scientist and that's not a really good, that's not a pure definition of an expert system. But I hear it thrown around so often and thrown, you know, we built, a decision, we built an expert system and it's like, yeah, it's a decision tree. It's really not an expert system, you know. But they do capture expertise. It's law's code a little bit. This is, uh, the lawyers in the room will, will, will hear Larry Lessig's book, right? Law's code there. It's also captured policy, right? Lawyers don't just advise their clients of what the law is, though. They, they also say, well, this is the law, but you really aren't going to get away with, <laughs> with defending yourself. You're, you're technically innocent, <laughs> you know? Uh, hopefully, there's also a lot of simplified language in here, right? Because you can't talk to self-representing litigants the way you talk to lawyers or judges. You have to use the non-specialized language there. There's heuristics, my favorite word, which is the rules of thumb. Don't do this this way. It never works. It's, it's allowed. The rules say it's okay, but we have learned through long experience that if you format your documents in this way or use these words, judges, you know, get grumpy or something like that. 
All of this, in my opinion, is legal education, interesting to legal education. Um, and what I mean by that is everybody that represents themselves is a lawyer for themselves. They're not a, you know, so, so, so that literally means everybody's a lawyer, potentially, right? Maybe not a really good lawyer, <laughs> but sometimes, as we've seen with the problem, the access to justice problem, they don't have a choice, right? Um, I'm going to skip the checklist part, but uh, maybe I'll come back to that one. So all these are opportunities. So A to J author, which does this stuff, all of these are opportunities, whoopsie daisy, for <coughs> teaching students about the law. You know, and, and I know I just said, well, this is just a decision tree authoring system, but it like covers a hell of a lot of ground in, in terms of opportunity for students to understand how to practice. And most of these things, actually, you won't find on your typical law school syllabus, except maybe in clinics, I hope. Where's Marjorie? Marjorie not here? She should be, like, breaking her neck nodding, I think. Um, you know, I, I'm hoping a lot of this stuff ends up in, in, in clinic work, maybe in some third-year seminars, but, but certainly not at the core of, legal, of, of law school classes. We've done some experiments with that, right? We've gotten 15, 20 schools that... Uh, dropped A to J author into the middle of a course. They went, um, for, for the amount of complexity that we were actually handling, it went amazingly well. I'm actually kind of surprised. Um, we learned some tough lessons. Training, you know, teaching students software requires a, a lot more support than you think, right? Um, and also a lot less. Um, some of that magic millennials are uh, born with, uh, with, with, with knowledge of, of technology happened. You know, they're like, oh yeah, I just bang away at this, and you know, fill in the little, fill in the little pockets, and the little tree gets built. You know, and others were like, I can't make this work. You know? So, so it was, uh, it was, it was an exercise in finding those balances and building tools that support that. Um, students have Macs, right? We knew that going in. We have to build something that will work on uh, that. Uh, that is Mac, uh, sorry, uh, operating system agnostic. See, Windows, silos, stuck with that again. Um, when we tried to hook students up with the busy legal aid attorneys, because they're the subject matter experts, that was hard. And if the students failed, we failed, because it was our project, even though it was their homework assignment. So, you know, that problem became part of our problem to solve. The ideal thing would be to run them through a semester where, we, where they learn the software, and they do it in a, what I would call a closed universe or a sandbox. They don't have to worry about other people's timings. And then, they, and then the second semester, you, you, you let them out into the live world uh, where they can um, uh, deal with real people and real problems. Did I see your hand going up? Okay, good. So, um, and the last one is uh, the faculty are also students here. Um, we didn't do enough teaching the faculty about the software and their reality on sort of like, well, what's all... Some, some magic's happening there because the students are smiling, but I sort of don't understand it all very well. And, and that was our fault. We didn't, like, you know, force them to say, well, now we've got to do a thing where we show you how this stuff works. Because if you're teaching it and including it in your class, you better have some, uh, some clues about this. All right. I just talked about some of these closed universe uh, uh, simulations. Um, uh, you know, maybe we can do these in multiple legal subject areas. In other words, we can create A to J decision trees that are not only in areas where there's uh, poor people, right? That's, what, that's, I, that's my love of this project, but why not decision tree projects that are in intellectual property and business corporations and contracting and all sorts of other areas in which there are, you know, if-then statements for determining what the right law is? Why not, right? Uh, cool. So... You know, we, we've come to know that basically this tool is, is uh, you know, what, what we thought was a hammer, you know, and everything looks like a nail. It's more like it's a Swiss Army knife, you know, and, uh, and there's all sorts of capabilities here, right? Document assembly, court forms, benefits calculators, um, whoopsie daisy, um, pre-court checklists, compliance, am I eligible? Online intake, we've got a half a dozen states that have automated their online intake. So now the person who used to call up and, and, and spend an hour or a half hour with a lawyer, and then at the end of that half hour, the lawyer would say, oh, yeah, you're ineligible. 
And they've both wasted a half hour, and they're both, well, the, the, the potential client is pissed. Instead, they go to a website, start answering questions. Hopefully, whoever designed it front-loaded it with all the pre-qualifying or disqualifying questions, like, you make too much money, we don't do parking tickets, blah, blah, blah. And the person goes, oh, okay, well, I won't waste my time bugging legal aid. They ain't for me. And no lawyer picked up a phone and listened to that person for a half hour, tell them their, uh, their legal problem, and didn't waste any time. You know, computer science people are like, duh. You know, why don't you guys do that in like the 60s when, when, when automation was invented, you know? And so here it is, 2017, we're doing that. <laughs> we're actually working on a legal health checkup project. I have my doubts. That, that legal health checkups are, have, uh, have the same, are a good parallel to like mental, not mental health, um, uh, medical health checkups, you know, but, um, but it's worth looking at, I think. Um, and uh, so, you know, I've got two decision trees on the brain. Decision trees, decision trees everywhere, it seems to me, in, in, in the area of law. Um, I am not a lawyer, so I'm wrong, but, um, but, but, but I'm running with this for right now. So, you know, the client comes and says things like this. I, am I eligible? Do I need to file this form? What are my options? What if I don't do this? Can I beat this? And what is the most common answer that you would hear from a lawyer to all of these questions? It depends. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> depends. And what does it depends mean? Well, if, and now you're into a decision tree, right? So that's why I've got decision trees on the brain. Now, I can't help. I can't help but diverge for just a moment and say, well, what about AI? So that's why I got Clippy up there. <laughs> Looks like you're initiating complex litigation. Would you like some help? <laughs> so I'm, I, I don't know if AI and the whole uh, robot lawyers things, but I did find this tweet. Artificial intelligence struggles to tell the difference between fried chicken and labradoodles. <laughs> Look at that. This is, I love this. It's like, <laughs> which ones are the dogs and which ones are the crunchy chicken? <laughs> there it is. A lot of people like that. No, oh, I like Labradoodles. <laughs> actually, they're, they're, it's just a joke. They're, they're, there actually is not an AI that can't distinguish between them, but it was pretty funny. This is the AI that we all are somewhat most familiar with. It's a Watson that wanted Jeopardy, you know, but oh my God. Something that plays a, an, a, uh, a game show, and, and now we're convinced it's going to like do legal work. Ah, come on, guys. Come on, guys. Law firms of the future will be filled with robot lawyers. <laughs> Rise of the robo lawyers. How legal... And, and then, you've got to read the second line, right? How legal representation could come to resemble TurboTax. I'm like, what's TurboTax? It's a decision tree. <laughs> you know, that's not a robo-lawyer. So there's a lot of this crap being slapped around that's, that bothers me. Um, oh, crap. I'm going to fix that right here. There we are. Shift F5. So, you know, robot lawyers, robot lawyers everywhere. Um, I, and it's not that I don't think AI is going to do some really interesting things, but I do know this that there aren't any interfaces or affordances for it that I can use to scale up to hundreds or thousands of faculty and students <laughs> using it as a way to teach the law. I don't see it. It's, it's too complicated to do that. You know, we just talked about the problem of getting faculty to tag questions with the subject area. <laughs> <laughs> you think we're going to do well on the AI stuff. <laughs> so. You know, let's get real here. Here's the other cool thing, though. This decision tree right now, we've got a tool that drops it off into a website, sorry, a, a desktop browser, or drops it off into a, um, a, a mobile, a, a mobile size browser. You know, it's not a stretch to say that this thing can drop into the software that is uh, uh, voice interactive, Alexa, OK, Google, Google Home things like that. Those are just decision trees. And if you read about chat bots and things like that, it's all about building decision trees that loop and make sure that the person you know, actually said what you expected them to say and things like that. And I've had some very interesting conversations with the Batovi folks, and I'm, I think I'm getting them way too excited about <laughs> the possibilities of exploring that. <laughs> so what's the big picture with this? 
Ah, hand tools. This is what we. This is what lawyers have been doing for for way too long. And what I mean here is not quill pens. I'm talking about word processors, spreadsheets, and email. These are these are hand tools. And that's the current state of things today. There's a few lawyers out there who have figured out power tools and are using document assembly and are using good case management systems and are doing uh, customer relationship management with their clients and, and SEO to, uh, to, get, to, get, to get noticed and to do marketing. But what we really need is a factory. We need law factories. Except what's the problem with this picture? Tell people. There's no people in it. <laughs> and that's not what I mean. I don't mean a factory of law that in an, an automated justice or robo lawyers. I mean, we need to build factories that are in the pocket of lawyers, right? It's the computers plus lawyers that's powerful, not computers instead of lawyers. But, but we're, we're not even, we're, we're barely at the powers tool stage is what I'm saying. So our A to J roadmap is that Jessica is going to get a demotion to A to J project manager. Sorry, promotion. <laughs> you know, um, you know we're, we're looking for a new back-end developer because we, and, a, and, a new, and maybe a new coder, a JavaScript coder. Um, we're hoping to host our own. We will be hosting our own A to J services because we want to go to uh, clinics and, uh, and nonprofits and, uh, and courts. That will, that will help us, that will give us money, maybe, and that will also give us projects or exposure to projects that we could then flip over into having schools work with them or, or law students work on those. We already have some, we have a partnership with a, with a, with a, a court software vendor right now. Their problem was bidding on the interface that SRLs would use using this new state court system and the, that state legal aid had been using A to J author, and so they came to us and said, maybe we can make a deal where you, you will pay for some of your, your, your coding or your staff or things like that to make this happen. We want to have the ability to explore these, all of these ideas and how they can affect legal education. Because all of this, like I said, all of this is, I think, the types of projects that students is, uh, is uh, William in here? Hawkins? No. William Hawkins is not here, are, are the types of things that students would love to be able to explore. And I'm not talking about the coding part. I'm talking about the decision tree building because it's turning the law into something that people can understand. I'm almost done. So Elaine Dell is uh, our project our, where we publish uh, open source casebooks. Uh, lawbooks.cali.org is our uh, is our website where you can take these casebooks or build your own. It's a self-publishing system built on top of uh, press books. That's Hugh McGuire. We're uh, we're we're, we're uh, participating in Hugh's latest project called the Rebus Foundation, in which he's uh, working with higher ed organizations to design an e-book production process for textbooks. Um, we find ourselves. Oh, this is going to sound um, not, not snarky. This is going to sound narcissistic. We find ourselves to be the smartest people in the room a lot of times, but that's okay. You know, somebody's got to have like you know uh, gone down the roads before, and, and we're we're providing whatever uh, support uh, and, and experience we can, and we are getting good feedback from from them. Um, there are a, a ton of interesting projects out there, and I'm talking about in law. Of course, I put our own on top. Wow, I forgot that I meant to spread this, this uh, slide out. So I'll just do it this way. So our, our you know, uh, Steve Johnson's Wetlands uh, course source, don't call it a course book or a case book, it's a course source because it has uh, links to YouTube videos and to uh, Kelly lessons written specifically for that. Uh, Charter Course is a vendor, yes, and a sponsor uh, here. Sorry, I've forgotten Mr. Tartar Course's name, but he's a law professor at... Mark Edwards, William Mitchell, or Mitchell Hamlin? Mitchell yeah, Hamlin? that's it, Mark Hamlin Edwards, Mitchell. Mark Edwards. You know, and, and don't call it a casebook. It's, it's, he, he builds, his tool has the casebooks delivered as uh, decision trees, no, as, as, giant, <laughs> as giant outlines, um, which are really kind of slick. I, lo I, love the, I love that thing. Uh, of course, we've got our own Elaine Dell works. Uh, James Boyle has published his intellectual property book. Semaphore Press has a, an interesting model where the students can either download it for free or pay what they want, although there is a suggested amount. 
So there's a lot of innovation going on in the uh, um, casebook publishing space. The problem is every single one of these and the traditional publishers were all bogged down in, in not knowing how to move forward. Right? The faculty don't want innovation too fast here. i got about three minutes. And, and so I, I think this is what I would call a demographic. And, and the biggest problem in this space is not us, but piracy. I always, every so often I will see on Reddit people posting links to uh, dark web or Google Docs of, uh, you know, a thousand photographs taken of every single page of a case book, you know, slammed into a compressed <coughs> file and shoved up and you can download it and save $250 if you're willing to read your case book as a bunch of images, you know, but for 250 bucks, maybe I would, right? Um, this one's a little bit more offensive, why college students are stealing their textbooks, but it, it's an article that basically goes into the, uh, the, the same thing. It's a big deal. So what's the big picture that I'm talking about here? We're doing pretty good. We're churning out books. We're, we're slowly getting more, or, uh, you know, three or four or five people a year to sign up. We pay people to write books. If you haven't written a case book, if you'd like to write a case book, you should submit a proposal to us. We pay money, not tiny money, not nonprofit money, kind of pretty big money because we know we're buying your time to do a very difficult intellectual um, um, process. So, so you know, if, you, if you're interested, you should contact us, right? Yeah? Interesting litmus maybe. Um, are there any instances in Elangdale yet where you have um, competing case books on the same topic? Where we have competing case books? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Tax, torts. Torts, tax, contracts. Oh, that's what comes to mind right off the top of my head. That, I think, you should see is really encouraging. Well, so this is the birth rates for the last uh, 100, almost 100 years. And you can see the, um, the, um, the boomer bubble there. Um, I, I, I kind of think we have to finish living through that, which is to say the, the, the current cohort of faculty have to... Um, <coughs> have to die or I'm a retire <laughs> before we can innovate any further in this space, including myself, perhaps. Um, all I'm saying is I don't think there's a fast way to do this. There's no shortcut. We're, gonna, we're just going to have to be, we're going to have to be able to persist to get past this. All right, breathe. Last one, incubators. It's short. So these are numbers I grabbed from the ABA website. The number of people graduating from law school that go into private uh, solo or small firm practice. And as you can see, the numbers in, 19, in 2005, it's 49% solo, it's 14% two to five, 6%. You know, it's in the 60, almost 70%. Here's the law firm size, two to five lawyers, 76, six to 10, 13. That's 89% of lawyers working in two to 10 size firms or something like that. I have a feeling I'm misreading that a little bit. But, the, but, it, but it, the, the point is, an awful lot of people graduate law schools and go out on their own or work in very small firms. And there isn't much to reflect that in the, in the curriculum um, for that. And that's what the incubator movement has been uh, working to, to address. They just recently had their fourth conference they, they're, they're into, the, the, the problem is they, they're, not, they're not able to scale yet, right? They're doing maybe 10 or 20 students per school per year. And so what is that over uh, the 60 schools that have incubators? That's, uh, you know, uh, maybe 1,000 students a year can get through an incubator. It's not enough, not when 75% of your students are going to become solo and only 5% of them are going to be able to go through an incubator program. Um, uh, Baylor, though, has done re something recently. I would, just was talking to them last week. It's call, they call it Legal Map Maker, which isn't at all what it... It doesn't do anything like what the name sounds, but it's essentially a boot camp that they do where um, they present on how you can... Uh, it's a two-day thing covering all the issues around setting up your own solo law firm. So their idea is we can't run everybody through a, uh, an incubator, but we can provide them with uh, the, the basic information and further reading. And the, and the quality of their materials is, is really good. There's a checklist followed by 10 or 20 pages of things to read. It's, it's, it's not hyper sophisticated and all super technology. It's, it's very bread and butter basic, you know. And, uh, 
They've only done it once. They're doing it again this August. They started right from the get-go going to all the schools in Texas, law schools in Texas, and saying, we can't do this alone. You've got to join us. And I'm saying to them, we need to go to the, all the law schools in the country. This is, this is a national project, and Cali's a national consortium. So that's why I'm talking to them. I think incubators sit at that really nice space that, that's law practice tech, access to justice, civitech, and therefore 